Hello everyone and welcome back. I'm your host Teresa and today we're gonna give some credit where it's very due by counting down the top 10 indigenous inventions that changed the world. So kick back, put the fry bread oil on a heat and let's go. Number 10 in the countdown is the kayak. Its true name is the Hayak. But foreigners didn't know how to pronounce this word and when they read it, they dubbed the one-manned boat a kayak. The hayak was used for over 2,000 years by the Inuit with the exception of those in the most northern regions. A little too cold for it there. This small narrow boat was created by the Inuit in the Arctic region of Canada. It's a piece of ingenuity. The cockpit was closed to avoid the passenger from sinking if the craft were to capsize, something that was completely unique at the time. These crafted transportation boats were created with wood or whalebone frames and covered with stitched seal skin or other animal pelts. They were perfect for the transportation of goods, travel, and hunting, allowing Inuit means of exploring Arctic geography and landscape while also accessing natural resources and other communities of Inuits. Oral tradition tells us that this was not only an item of practicality, however, but also one of personal growth and connection to self and community. Today, the kayak is used by many for leisure, sports, tourism, and competition. Number nine is baby bottles and formula. The baby bottle has been found in a few northern indigenous clans histories, Iroquois and Seneca being the prime examples. The baby bottle of the past is drastically different from the plastic and silicon model found in stores today. Water skins were used by ancient Egyptians and global indigenous colonies alike, but the indigenous inventors made some changes so as to use them to accommodate babies. First, they did not use goat skin like the Egyptians, but rather the dried then greased bag shaped stomachs of their large prey like boars, bears, and buffalo. Secondly, they learned to attach a bird quill on the end of the intestinal piece to act as a nipple to create the first baby bottle. According to the Iroquois historian Arthur C. Parker, the intestinal tube would be filled with a mix of pounded meats, berries, and nuts. It was cooked until the mixture inside turned into a warm paste or liquid. Another baby food or milk alternative was corn and water mixtures. Number eight was better when we didn't have to pay rent for them. It's apartments. Indigenous colonies around the world executed the same idea. Many people residing in the same building, but in different ways. In Southern America, the Anasazi may have moved south after the warfare decimated their population, but their historic community still stands. The Anasazi were masters of the humble yet expansive identical apartments. Before the arrival of Europeans, indigenous peoples in Canada had their own building traditions. Differing from nation to nation depending on their purpose and function, the building traditions reflected the important aspects of indigenous peoples, cultures, societies, geographics, environments, and spiritual beliefs. In eastern woodlands, Iroquois, Haudenosaunee, Wendat, and others, characteristic dwelling was the longhouse, a metaphor for life wherein families gathered and ceremonies assembled. It looks as it sounds, long and narrow in structure and meant to house several families related through the female lineage. A village would oftentimes be a group of these longhouses surrounded by pole-based fences. Another example is the wigwams, which was generally housing one to three families and were used in eastern woodlands and subarctic regions. Wigwams were able to be disassembled and reassembled for those who moved with the season or with the hunting. Imagine that, you hate your neighbor, you can just pack up your whole house, head out. Number seven, let's check out the raised bed agriculture. One of the most famous examples in the Inca dynasty, historians and archeologists were mind blown to discover the Incas understood water irrigation, underwatering, floating farms and gardens, and raised bed agriculture. The indigenous of South and Central America invented the technique of enriching soil and piling it to build raised garden plots called chinap on swampy land and in lakes, a forerunner model now used for modern vegetable farming. Well, this practice spread from Mesoamerica to other indigenous colonies of South and Central America and then further. The Three Sisters, which are corn, beans, and squash's method of growing, showed up along the East Coast and Great Lakes of Canada. The raised beds allowed for control over the growing environment, something that wild planting could not. But unlike that style of row agriculture, the three plants were allowed to grow together, creating a microenvironment for ripe growth. The sisters were only to be segregated by blocks and mounds to keep them free from weeds. Scared of heights? Number six isn't, it's suspension bridges. That's right, in ancient, ancient times, people were constructing bridges. Want to get stressed? Let's talk about the materials used. In South America, the Inca figured out how to weave certain mountain grasses and other plants into thick ropes that could be used to make bridges. The Incas were the only pre-industrial American culture to invent long span suspension bridges, said to have rigged 200 plus bridges 
ranges across gorges and cliffs. In another rugged region, the Himalayans seem to independently develop suspension systems at pretty much the exact same time, albeit they were different. But the Europeans didn't have the know-how until several centuries later after the Inca Empire fell. Embarrassing. Northwest BC is home to some suspension bridges made of wood systems. The best known is the bridge over the Buckley River at the Hagwagat Canyon. The design theory is similar to that of the Inca and Himalayan, the strongest point extending outwards from the edges and then a gangway tied to join the two halves in the center point. The physics of these historic bridges was something European and American engineers copied for our modern bridges in the early 20th century. You can visit the last standing suspension bridge made by the ancient Inca of South America in Peru, Canas province. Dare you to walk across. Number 5 is the first syringe. Hello to our pre-Columbian friends again, you guys were killing it in the invention game. Indigenous of South America were known to have fashioned a syringe using animal remains. Like with the baby bottle, a sac like organ was used to hold the liquid. In this case, the choice was smaller animal bladders. Next, a hollowed bird bone with a sharpened tip was attached and used as a needle. How on earth did indigenous peoples got called primitive is beyond me. The ability to even recognize medicines, make them injectable, and figure out the knowledge of the body in prehistoric times enough to know what would happen should it be injected and where, frankly, it's remarkable. In fact, the syringe didn't show up in European medicine until the 1850s, when Scottish physician Alexander Wood thought maybe using needles to inject more could relieve pain. Right. And what medicine were the indigenous colonies using in these syringes? Number four is anesthetic medicines, topicals, oh my. Traditional medicine is part of cultural legacy of indigenous peoples and their purpose for more than 2,500 plant species. Like the Takana and the Leko who use quinine, cat's claw, and avanta, all plants recognized by modern pharmaceutical industries. First Nations used olefin, hydrocarbons, and methane to make petroleum jelly and used it to hydrate and protect animal and human skin. The Amazonian and Andean indigenous people of South America pioneered the use of a variety of medicinal plants to manage ailments. An example of this is ginger. We currently use it to flavor dishes, but indigenous healers prepared it as a medicinal drink to relieve pain or reduce inflammation. Another remedy for pain and inflammation was black willow bark. Once it gets into the body, salsin produces salicylic acid, the active ingredient in modern aspirin tablets. That's right, they produced aspirin. And in modern day Virginia, Jimson weed was ground and used as a plaster on external injuries and bruises. It could be injected or ingested as an anesthetic while broken bones were set. There are even treatments for hemorrhoids, suppositories made from dogwood trees, a material still used medicinally today. Oral contraceptives were invented when the Shoshone and Potawatomi used herbs like stone seed and dog bane to prevent pregnancy. I swear I could make an entire video about the medicines and remedies invented by indigenous people, many of which were also the first ways to brush teeth, cleanse breath, heck, even the first sunscreen was invented through indigenous healing practices. It's truly unreal what was accomplished and I personally recommend sweet fern tea for your next stomach bug or hangover. Rubber is number three and no, not the contraceptive. Many don't know that natural latex is derived from plants and trees. Many also don't know that the Aztecs, Olmec and Maya of the Mesoamerica are known to have made rubber using this natural latex. It would be harvested from rubber trees and mixed with the juice of morning glory vines. These two plants ironically would grow very close to each other. Other, so it's believed that's how ancient civilizations stumbled across the vine's fluid containing a chemical that solidified latex so it wouldn't be brittle anymore. Depending on your latex to vine juice ratio, your rubber could differ. Some came out more bouncy, like a rubber ball used in the famous Mesoamerican ball games. Other combinations created durable leather, which was likely used for homes as well as for sandals, which were described by Spanish conquistadors that have never been found by archaeologists. When you look into Aztec civilization, it's not a surprise that they were making advanced rubber they truly had the spirit of scientific inquiry. Number two is I can't hear you. Thankfully, that was no concern to the indigenous peoples, as when speakers of one language met those of another in trade, council, travels, or conflicts, they communicated in the then universal language of hand talk. It's dated past 30 years old and observed among Florida tribes by the 16th century Spanish colonizers. This is considered one of the oldest languages in North America, without a word ever being spoken. Though universal in North America, 
Hantok was more prominent amongst the nomadic Plains nations, earning the modern day title of Plains Indian Sign Language, or PISL. So if sign language was around for this long, why didn't you know and why isn't it a worldwide language like English is? Two reasons. One, by the late 1800s, tens of thousands of indigenous people still used Hantok, but that changed when the federal government and Catholic Church initiated the erasure of indigenous people and culture. This destroyed the communities and history for decades to come. And two, in the 1870s and 1880s, fierce opponents of sign language called oralists were led by the apparent Canadian legend Alexander Graham Bell on an ableist mission to ban sign language and force hearing impaired people to communicate by lip reading or learning to speak because it was apparently more convenient for everyone else. He rightfully failed as ASL and indigenous hand talk are still recognized and used to date. He did introduce some new techniques some hearing impaired people just prefer more. McKay Cody is the first deaf researcher to specialize in North American hand talk and today helps work with indigenous colonies and tribes to help preserve the original sign language. She's also pushing for PISL to be rightfully incorporated into mainstream education of ASL. At number one in the countdown, no it wasn't the Greeks and it wasn't the Romans. How indigenous democracy made the colonial world. The Haudenosaunee Confederacy of what is now upstate New York developed a democracy made up of six nations, with each tribe taking care of its own governance. Consisting of 117 rules recorded on strings of wampum beads, the Great Law of Peace, an oral constitution, was designed to help the Haudenosaunee live in harmony. Dating to as early as perhaps 1142, this charter is based on community unity, liberty, and equity. It even provides for the separation of powers and outlines impeachment procedures. Should any major issue arise in a tribe that was of interest to all tribes, the six would convene in a middle point and to make any decisions together. Beside vesting the community with the power to choose its leaders, a right which at the time may have been unique in the world, it was even described that the ideal character of those leaders was a servant to their people rather than an overlord. You were to lead with empathy, honesty, bravery. The United States of America traces its political roots to the Declaration of Independence in 1776, but by then democracy was old news in the so-called New World. During the American Revolution, thousands of indigenous already lived under a system of governance. So as the founding fathers began crafting a more perfect union from scratch, they followed the example of the Six Nations. This is documented in letters written by George Bush, but also acknowledged hundreds of years later in 1988 by American Congress who said the confederation of the original 13 colonies into one republic was influenced by the political systems developed by the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, as were many of the democratic principles which were incorporated into the constitution itself, a constitution that the indigenous peoples would be left out of. Thank you so much for tuning in and sticking around. I hope you learned something new today. Always remember to thank the land you're on and take time to appreciate what you have. Like and subscribe if you want to see more, and peace until next time.